Well, good morning to you. It is great to be back after a couple weeks off. Angel and I were able to get away and go down to the beach and wake up at 5.45 a.m. in the morning every single day of our vacation because we have a child. And so that was really enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> but really, we were able to get away and relax and be at the beach. Piper is a beach girl, man. That's my daughter's name. She loves the beach, running up and down. She chased a dog for like a half a mile. And, uh, and birds and stuff, and she just had an absolute blast, and so it was really cool being able to give her her first time at the beach, uh, and we did have a wonderful time. We are so thankful for the church being able to um, give us an opportunity to get away and have uh, men in our church being willing to, to preach as well. Chris is correct. We are starting a new sermon series about questions that you don't ask in church. And so we're going to deal with some of those hot topics that are often brushed to the side because they're controversial uh, or that people just don't like talking about them because they make you feel uncomfortable in church. And so in four weeks, in four weeks, we're going to be talking about what the Bible has to say about alcohol. This is a huge cultural issue. A lot of people are confused about what the Bible has to say about alcohol. And so we're going we're gonna to teach on that in four weeks. And then in three weeks, we're going to be touching about something that is really, really sensitive, and that has to do with sex. So get ready to be uncomfortable. Come to hear a message about what God has to say. For you parents out there that are concerned, maybe you have kids in youth group from grade 6 through 12. Everyone else should actually be with Caro and Kids Connect. There's going to be an alternative that's going to be offered in the gym in the youth area by Kyle. And so if you don't feel like that your kids should hear a sermon like that, because it will be PG-13, there will be that alternative that you can take your kids to. But if you want to talk with your kids and you want them to be in here to hear this message, then by all means, that's, that's your decision as a parent. And then in two weeks, next week, we're going to be talking about suffering. We're going to be answering the question, why does God let us suffer? Why does God put us through some of the things that we have seen, like hurricanes and volcanoes and murder and just things that just really break our heart? That, that cause us suffering. Why does God let that happen? But today, we're going to be talking about doubt, right? This is a question you don't ask in church. Am I allowed to doubt and still be a Christian? And I don't know about you, but my upbringing was basically this. You sit there, you keep your mouth shut, and you don't ask questions, right? And when it comes to, to doubt, you don't question your parents, you don't question what the Bible teaches, you don't question what the church teaches, you just sit there and you take it, and you say, yes, sir, and you say, yes, I believe that. But what happens? And we have questions, right? We have things that happen in our life that bring up doubt, that bring up questions, whether or not we trust God, whether or not the Bible is true, whether or not Jesus really did resurrect from the dead. And so when we live our lives, we can go through a lot of things that, that bring up doubts and insecurities. And we really wonder, is Christianity true? Is Christianity even worth it? And so we're going to walk through what the Bible has to say about doubt, and we're going to answer that question. And I think everyone in here has felt doubt about something at some point in time. For me, one big moment of doubt was when I found out that we were going to have a baby. Uh, it was in April, and so there were a lot of doubts and fears that were associated with that. Am I going to be a good father? Will my baby be healthy? Will I be able to provide for my family? Will God protect my family? Will Angel make it through the pregnancy and everything be okay? And there was actually one brief moment when Angel actually gave birth to Piper that she began to lose a lot of blood and you could see it almost instantly. Her face and her body turned white and that brief thought ran through my mind. Will I be the only person to raise Piper? Will Angel make it through this moment? And there are a lot of fears and insecurities that you can have as a parent. And I think about, you know, what will my church family think? Will they support me in, in having a family? And so, you know, we have these doubts, and we have these worries, and we have these fears. Husbands and wives, we doubt, is, is my husband or my wife fully committed to me? Are, are they, do they love me? Do they love my body? Am I beautiful to them? Am I handsome to them? Do my kids respect me? And these doubts can just flood our minds and create a lot of worry and anxiety in our life. And so if I could put it like this, when we ask questions about Christianity, is, is having Piper worth it to me? Is being Angel's husband worth it to me? Am I telling the truth that I am still 100% committed to her, both my daughter and my wife, despite my doubts? Can I answer yes? 
And it's the same way with, with our relationship with Jesus is absolutely, you can have doubts about Christianity and still be firmly committed to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just like I can have doubts about my fatherhood and still be 100% committed to loving and raising Piper and being the best dad that I can possibly be to her. You see, both of these things are possible. And we have these doubts that run through our minds all the time. And you know, people do ask me, and it's usually privately, because everyone's afraid to, to say whether or not you actually doubt things in Christianity, right? Whether or not the Bible is true, or it's just made up of stories. Whether or not Jesus really resurrected from the dead. And so people always come, and, and they'll ask me, you know, Rick, do, do you doubt that Christianity is true? And I'll say, absolutely not. I've never doubted a moment in my life. Well, that's not true, right? Absolutely, I have doubts. That's what's, that's what's brought me to this moment in my faith. You see, my doubt is a motivating and driving factor to discover the answer to the questions that I have about God, about life, about Jesus, about morality, about where I came from and where I am going. And so we have this incredible story in Matthew chapter 21. Jesus had led an incredible ministry. And we come upon this scene that's called the triumphal entry where Jesus is riding a donkey into Jerusalem. And people are shouting and praising, blessed is the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory be to the king is what they are saying. And so Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and he comes upon this temple that is ravaged with immorality. You've got thievery, you've got manipulation, you've got people taking advantage of the poor. And so Jesus comes in pretty fired up. And he enters the temple, the temple grounds, and he begins turning over temples and whipping people out and saying, How dare you turn my father's house into a den of thieves? He is totally disgusted with his fellow brothers and sisters under Judaism. And so as you can imagine, he is so frustrated, he retreats and he sees this fig tree as he retreats. And he walks up to the fig tree because what's a fig tree supposed to have on it? Figs. And there's nothing there. And this fig tree represents Israel. That Israel was supposed to produce a fruit and they didn't. And in an instant, Jesus cursed the tree and it withered and it faded away and it died. And the disciples were shocked. I mean, how could somebody... Even the Messiah kill a plant just by the word of his mouth. How could somebody like Jesus, that was symbolically for Israel now is what we're saying, how could somebody like Jesus destroy the very nation, these are Jews thinking, the very nation that is supposed to control the world? The Jews had this misguided mindset, this misguided idea that they were supposed to dominate the world and and the Messiah is going to reign in Jerusalem with a white stallion and big mansions and everyone is going to be subject to Israel. And yet Jesus looks at this fig tree and says, Israel is finished. And so it almost seems impossible in their minds that the Messiah could save Israel and make it the promised nation that they heard about in the Old Testament. And so they begin to doubt, right? Right? How could God, how could Jesus, how could the Messiah destroy the very thing that's been keeping us alive that we've been hoping for? We are hoping that Israel controls and dominates the world and we're victorious. And Jesus is saying that because we're not producing the fruit that we should, it's going to die and wither away. And in Matthew chapter 21, verse 21, Jesus tells them this. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even you will say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and it will happen. And this hyperbole literature is what we would describe it as. Jesus is saying, you think that Israel is lost? You think that I can't fulfill the Old Testament scripture that was written about me and about this nation? Things are possible with God. Mountains can be moved which is, like I said, a hyperbole. These things that seem impossible with God are actually possible. If you are willing to trust me, that's what, that's what faith is. If you are willing to place your confidence and your trust in me and do not doubt, big things can happen, not only with you, but for this nation. And so they have this incredible doubt. And, and it almost seems as like Jesus is saying, if you claim and name your faith, you can have it. It's that name it, claim it stuff. Have you ever heard about that on TV? You'll see evangelists on TV say, if you name it and you claim it, it'll be yours. 
And they sell these like little stupid washcloths and miracle water. And they're like, if you take this statue and you bury it upside down inside your yard, your house will sell. All right, that stuff is complete garbage. It is false. The name it, claim it theology is, is, is not the gospel. That's not what Christianity teaches. You cannot put water on something blessed by someone and then it actually becomes yours, okay? That is a devil doctrine and it is a false tactic. Do not fall for it. And that's not what Jesus is talking about here. But what we should glean from this is that even the disciples of Jesus themselves doubted. They had things in their mind that, they, that were up for question. And if, if we could define doubt, I would put it like this. Doubt is a lack of certainty concerning the teachings of Christianity or one's personal relationship with them. Doubt is a lack of certainty concerning the teachings or the doctrine of Christianity or your personal relationship with them. And so there are two types of doubts, right? The first one is a factual doubt. This is what we talk about when we say things like apologetics, which is the defense of Christianity. Or if we get into the realm of philosophy. And so it answers the questions, can I be rational and logical and intelligent and still be a Christian? And so we do have factual doubts. C.S. Lewis said this, and if you know anything about C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis was an atheist, a very prominent and intelligent atheist, and he came to believe in Christianity because of evidence and reason and logic and science. But once he became a Christian because of the evidence, look at what he writes. He said, now that I am a Christian, I do have moods. What is a mood? A mood is an emotion, right? Right? It's not based on rationality or intellect, it's based on emotion. He says, I do have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. But when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. And so C.S. Lewis points out something very important, is that while we may have intellectual doubts about the truthfulness of Christianity, we can also have what are called emotional doubts. Emotional doubts deal in the realm of psychiatry, psychology, and counseling. And we ask this question, is Christianity really worth it? Will my following Jesus really be worth my sacrifice, my time, my money, my relationships? Am I following him for nothing? Os Guinness says this. He says that our doubts are not primarily a Christian problem, but a human problem. The root of doubt is not in our faith, but in our humanness. And so this doubt thing is a universal problem. It is something that we all really do struggle with. It is something that even the most brilliant minds on the face of this world have wrestled with. And so if you are here this morning and you have ever doubted whether or not Christianity is true, if you've ever doubted whether or not Christianity is worth it, you are in good company. If I could focus in on a single point, it would be this. We begin doubting Christianity when we lose sight of its foundation, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And like I said, as with C.S. Lewis and Os Guinness, this, this isn't a problem that is foreign to the Old and the New Testament. You had people who intimately followed Jesus, and let me put this clear for you, who literally saw people resurrect from the dead, who literally saw people be miraculously healed, who literally saw Jesus walking on water and speaking with God and being transformed, they doubted whether or not Jesus was the Messiah and whether or not he resurrected from the dead. I mean, put yourself in that position, right? Uh, We've had people recently, within the last couple months, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, people that we care about pass away. Would you believe in Jesus right? If I were to resurrect a person from the dead, wouldn't that validate that I'm saying something that is true? Now imagine witnessing something like that and then going on to doubt me. That would be almost insane. But that's what these disciples are doing. The first one that I want to tell you about is John the Baptist. And in Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 23, we find this story about John the Baptist. Let me tell you a little bit about John. John was a man who was to prepare the way for the Lord. But John eventually had doubts. John baptized Jesus. He saw a dove descend upon Jesus. He heard God speak from heaven. I mean, come on, people, right? I heard the Lord speak from heaven about this person named Jesus claiming to be his son. Uh, Do you think that there would be any really good reason to doubt the Messiahship of Jesus if you were John the Baptist? 
you saw this guy heal people. And John ends up in prison, and he is literally probably days away from his head being removed from his body. And he knows this, right? The king, Herod, had sentenced John to death, going to put his head on a platter. And so John is sitting in jail, and you can imagine, just, just think about yourself being in that moment, in a dark prison, buried in a hole under a ground or into a rock, and you have this emotional experience, you're questioning God, why would God put me in this place? And in John chapter 7, verse 22, we find John doing this. He sends disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Look at verse 22 of chapter 7. And so the disciples come to him, and they ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus answered them, go and report to John what you have seen and what you have heard, that the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. He didn't ridicule John. He didn't say, you name it, and you claim it, and it'll be yours, okay? He didn't say, for 99 cents, if you buy my spiritual water, you can have this freedom. You know, he didn't say that. What Jesus offered to John's emotional doubt was steadfast truth. Tell John what you've experienced. Tell John what you've heard and what you've seen. Tell John the testimony that is going out through all the land. And then John can make his rational decision based off of what? Off of the evidence. And so in the midst of John's doubt, Jesus not only gives him evidence, but he also gives him exhortation. I mean, think about this. Look at verse 28. Jesus said, he's he's telling his disciples, just after John had doubt about whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. Look at what Jesus says about John in verse 28. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Think about that for a minute. In the midst of John's doubt, questioning the Messiahship of Jesus, after everything he saw and experienced, Jesus still proclaims him to be one of the greatest men in the kingdom of God. If John had that type of prestige in the eyes of Jesus with his doubts, what does that say about you and I, who are probably considerably lesser than John? It means that God is not going to drop you out just because you have doubts in your own mind as you walk through him, walk through with him in Christianity. It means that God isn't going to abandon you because you maybe question the reliability of the, of the, new, the new or the Old Testament, because maybe you have doubts about the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe you have real intellectual or emotional doubts. God isn't just going to reject you and push you away and say, You just don't have enough faith, so you don't belong to me. And that is reassuring to me, because it means that God is willing to walk through us, walk through with us, excuse me, with our doubts. Yeah, I know, I keep saying that. And so here we find John, one of the greatest prophets, having doubts about Jesus, being claimed to be great in the eyes of God. But then how about this guy? And many of you know who I'm getting ready to bring up, right? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas is a apostle of Jesus. The first time he pops up on the scene is in John chapter 11, verse 6. And Thomas <laughs> believed in Jesus so much that he was willing to die for Jesus. He tells the other disciples, he says, let's go follow Jesus and die with him. I mean, think about having that type of loyalty and faith in the Messiahship. He even saw Lazarus in this, in this passage of scripture being resurrected from the dead. Imagine seeing those things. Imagine experiencing that. And here, at the end of his life, John, or Thomas, who was willing to die for Jesus, who saw Jesus resurrect Lazarus from the dead, has doubts. We find him asking this question, did Jesus really resurrect from the dead? In John chapter 20, if you'll turn there with me, starting in verse 24, Jesus had been crucified and he had been buried in a tomb for three days. His body was wrapped, all the disciples knew it, he was gone. The Messiah, who was supposed to control the world, who was supposed to bring Israel back from death, was now dead. Their hopes were shattered, their dreams were shattered, their emotions were shattered, most of them were in hiding. But then something happens. You have these women who went to pay honor to the tomb, Mary Magdalene being one of them, 
And she comes back and she tells the disciples, Jesus is not there. In fact, I have seen the risen Lord. And then you got this apostle named John and this apostle named Peter. And they go, they rush to the tomb, and they don't see Jesus anywhere. And they actually experience the risen Lord. But there's one person who hasn't yet, and his name's Thomas. And look at what Thomas says here in John chapter 20, verse 24. Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, uh, who was not with them when Jesus came, And verse 25 says, so the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in their midst and he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Thomas? You're a loser, and you shouldn't have doubted me. (laughs) That's not what he does. How dare you doubt the eyewitness testimony of your brothers? That's not what he says. He says, Thomas, let me give you some evidence. Let me show you that what I have done is true. He says, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach here, your hand, and put it into my side. And then he does rebuke him. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Do not doubt. Believe on the evidence. Follow your reason, Thomas. Examine me. Test me. See me. And stop doubting. Overcome your emotion. Overcome your rationality and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And look what Thomas answered to him. My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see yet believe. You see, we this morning find ourselves in the very same position as Thomas. We've got eyewitness testimony, people who are willing to give up everything and gain nothing because they encountered the risen Lord, people who are willing to go through excruciating pain and hardship because they encountered the risen Lord, people who are willing to give up their own families, their own lives because they encountered the risen Lord, people who preached and taught about Jesus and wrote scripture and absolutely refused to deny him on independent, separate accounts because they encountered the risen Lord. They refused to recant. They never admitted that it was a lie. Even on the most excruciating torture, being boiled in oil, having a spear run through your body, being dragged to the streets with a rope tied around your neck, seeing your family thrown in prison and executed before your very own eyes, they never recanted because they encountered the risen Lord. Their doubt diminished and it turned into proclamation. And so even though Thomas in this passage was rebuked, Jesus offers him evidence and fear uh, in face of his doubt. And this was not at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This was at the end. And so if I could bring it clear to you, I would simply say this. Jesus doesn't toss you out if you doubt. And so we think, I've got to work all this out before, before I become a Christian. I've, I've got to figure this thing out. I've got to overcome all my doubts before I give my life to Jesus. That is absolutely and utterly untrue. It is through the process of your doubts that you have a deeper and more meaningful faith. Charles Hummel put it like this. A stronger faith can emerge through a siege of doubt. Both holiness and faith are forged in the fires of temptation. And so when dealing with doubts, we need to distinguish between factual doubt and emotional doubt. But also, we need to deal with our doubts by examining the evidence, using our reason, applying wisdom in spite of our emotions. And so we come to this question this morning. How do we overcome our mountain of doubt? How do we overcome these occurrences in our lives or these objections to Christianity when we experience the risen Lord or we're discovering whether or not this Christianity thing is true? What do we do to move past these doubts? I think the truth of the matter is, is that we are all under attack by the enemy. Satan and his demons are real. They are evil. They want to destroy you. They want to place a seed of doubt in your mind and then make you too lazy to discover the truth. You can't waste your time with that stuff. Oh, it's all garbage. 
Don't waste your time reading the Bible. Don't waste your time listening to Christian philosophers and theologians and apologists. Go listen to somebody like Richard Dawkins. He'll provide a real perspective for you. Go listen to some atheist like Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens or Daniel Dennett. And if you just listen to these guys who are the intellectual elites of the world, you'll finally be a rational, intelligent person. And if Satan can trick you into being lazy, into being ignorant, he is one. And you would not believe the amount of incredible scientists, philosophers, theologians, psychiatrists, psychologists who steadfastly and unwaveringly follow the Lord Jesus Christ because of evidence, because of logic, because of reason, and because of personal experience. And so you should not leave here this morning with a question on your mind that you are unwilling to strive with every part of your being to get answered. Answer your doubts by investigating the truthfulness of Christianity. And so Satan wants us to question God's work and God's worth and drive us into utter laziness in discovering truth. And his work, C.S. Lewis, if you have never read this book, or even better, listen to this book on audio, okay? It is by C.S. Lewis, and he deals with this guy called Wormwood. And he approaches it from the aspect of, uh, of, of a demon, right? What would demons say and think about the world that we are in? And it really provides you a perspective from the other side. What is the enemy doing to me? How are they perceiving me? What are their tactics? And so the guy who reads it has this very rustic voice, and it's kind of scary, and it kind of sounds like a demon, you know what I mean? And so, and so this, is, this is what C.S. Lewis writes from the perspective of a demon. But you can worry him with a haunting suspicion that the practice is absurd, the practice of praying. And you can have no objective result. Don't waste your time praying. Don't waste your time searching Christianity. It's not going to do anything for you. Don't forget to use the heads win, tails you lose argument. If the thing he prays for doesn't happen, then that is one more proof that the petitionary prayers don't work. If it does happen, he will, of course, be able to see some of the physical causes which led up to it. And therefore, it would have happened anyway. And thus a granted prayer becomes just a good proof as a denied one that prayers are ineffective. He goes on to write this. But there is so, a, a sort of attack on the emotions which can and still be tried. It turns on making him feel that all of his religion is nothing but a fantasy. And so naturally, under attack, refusing to follow logic and reason and search out Christianity and whether or not it's true, you've got somebody like Bart Ehrman, who was an evangelical Christian for the majority of his life, who went to seminary. And if you've never heard of Bart Ehrman, he is the leading agnostic scholar of textual criticism of the Bible. And so Bart Ehrman gives the main reason, right, the grand applause for why he's rejected Christianity. And he writes this, about nine or ten years ago, I came to realize that I simply no longer believe the Christian message. A large part of my movement away from the faith was driven by my concern for suffering. I simply no longer could hold to the view, which I took to be essential to the Christian faith, that God was active in the world, that he answered prayer, and that he intervened on behalf of the faithful, that he brought salvation in the past, and that in the future, eventually, in the coming eschaton, he would set to rights all that was wrong. And that he would vindicate his name and his people and bring in a kingdom, either at our deaths or here on earth, in a future utopian experience. It was because of suffering that led him to reject the truthfulness of Christianity. Emotions should not override logic. What you experience and what you feel does not determine whether or not something is true. And this is why it's so important, folks, is because even atheist philosophers who reject the existence of God have concluded that the problem of evil and suffering is not a good reason to reject the truthfulness of theism, let alone Christianity. Let me give you a couple quotes. Atheist J.L. Mackey, full throttle atheist, not a Christian, doesn't believe in God, believes that God does not exist. We concede that the problem of evil does not, after all, show that the central doctrines of theism are logically inconsistent with another. William L. Rowe, who was another atheist, he says this, some philosophers have contended that the existence of evil is logically inconsistent with the, the, with the existence of the theistic God. 
No one, I think, has succeeded in establishing such an extravagant claim. It's irrational. It's not true. But can you see, when I see something like the hurricanes that hit Florida and Houston or, or the Asian islands, when I see such terrible suffering, when I see such horrible things go on in this life, it causes us to do what? Doubt. It erects this huge mountain before us, and we don't know if it can be moved because we feel so hurt and we have so much suffering, and the suffering is very real. I'm not diminishing the suffering by any means. What I'm saying is this. Our emotional doubt sometimes can override the intellectual truth of Christianity, and we can't let it stop there. And so we're coming full circle. We're at the mountain of God, right? Jesus has just cursed this fig tree, And he says, do not doubt. If you trust in me, if you have faith, you can say to that mountain, move, and it will go into the sea. And so this mountain serves as this image of the difficult things in our life. For the disciples, it was two things. The destruction of Israel and the suffering they were were getting ready to embark upon. They were going to lose everything. But most of the mountains in our life are probably emotional circumstances. There may be some intellectual doubts. And we come up with objections to Christianity, not because it's false, but because we're in pain, because we hurt. And so here are the disciples. Imminent doom for their beloved nation. Jesus, their Messiah, predicted his death. The disciples are beginning to leave Jesus. And Jesus tells them that they are going to suffer in ways that they could never imagine. They were hated and ostracized by their community and their religious leaders. And then finally, Jesus himself is arrested and crucified, naked, on a cross, in the most humiliating and excruciating way possible. Peter denies Jesus. The disciples run, and they hide, and they're afraid, and they're scared, and they say, I guess it wasn't worth it after all. They reached such a deep moment in their walk with God that they were ready and willing to leave the Lord. But then something happened. What was it that happened? Jesus resurrected from the dead. You see, any difficulty can be overcome by faith. And by faith, it is not defined as belief in in the absence of truth or belief in the absence of facts or taking a blind leap into the darkness. Oh, no. But importantly, it is trust. And if you don't respond properly to doubt, it will take you out. Don't leave your life with a question mark. Discover, search, find, look at the truth, examine the evidence. In other words, you've got to be present at the mountain in order for it to be moved. And so how did Jesus overcome their doubt? Well, he said things like, don't let, you, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in me. And if you can't believe in the words that I am saying, believe on the evidences that I have shown you in my life. And so I want to conclude this morning with some simple ways that you can overcome doubt. First of all, identify the issue. Is it an emotional issue or is it a factual issue? Once you can discover that, secondly, understand the Savior. Understand that he responds with clarity and compassion, not anger, not scolding. He walks alongside us in our doubts. He even invites us to reason with him. And so we should examine the evidence and embrace his forgiveness. One of my favorite scriptures is Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 where the Bible says, Come now, let us reason together. And though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like the crimson, they will be like wool. In other words, Israel, work through your doubts. Let me forgive you. Work through your worries and let me give you the forgiveness and the love and the compassion that I want to give you. And so we need to identify the issue. We need to understand the Savior. And thirdly, we need to be prepared for the mountain. I mean, can you imagine saying, hey, let's go on a hike? And then you go on a hike and you've got flip-flops on with shorts, maybe, uh, you know, a a button-up t-shirt because you're weird and you wear shorts with button-up t-shirts. And so you go on this hike, and you are totally unprepared for any type of obstacles or terrain. I mean, think about that for a minute. Wouldn't you think, wow, this is a really stupid idea. We should not go through life unprepared for our mountains, our unanswered prayers, our suffering, our pain, our anxiety, our intellectual hurdles. 
Maybe we enter the academia world and we start hearing things from atheists and agnostics and people who don't believe in God. Don't walk into that type of world thinking that you can just have faith and everything will be okay. No, you've got to prepare yourself. You see, doubt can be a part of the path that leads us deeper towards God. And so the Bible simply puts it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed that he does not fall. Be aware, be mindful, be prepared for your mountain. What are you going to do when you lose somebody that you love? What are you going to do when your friend at work that you respect, who is much smarter than you, starts giving you reasons why he doesn't believe in God? What are you going to do when you don't get the spouse you prayed for, or that your marriage ends in divorce, or that, God forbid, one of your children leave this life far much sooner than what they should? What are you going to do when those mountains come before you and the doubts start flooding in? Are you going to be prepared? Are you going to be ready for that? Number four, we should trust in God by asking for wisdom. James chapter five, 1, verse, verses 5 through 8, this is where God eventually wants to lead all of us. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all generously and without reproach. And it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. God, send me a teacher who can teach me. Send me a book that I can read to educate myself. Help clear my mind of distractions and emotions and hurts that cloud my thinking. God, give me your wisdom to deal with this doubt. And so we come to the end of the message with simply this. Where else will you go? Is Christianity true? Is Christianity worth it? Well, where else are you going to go? Jesus in his ministry was teaching some really tough stuff. He was telling people that he was going to die as the Messiah. In fact, one specific part, he said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, uh, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And people began to leave. What turned from hundreds became 50, became 20, became 12. And he sits down with his disciples after everyone's gone and he looks at them. And he says, will you too leave me? It's in John chapter 6. Will you as well leave me? And think about the pressure that they're under. All of these people are leaving Jesus. Their friends, their family. Jesus is teaching some really weird stuff. And they're sitting there, and I can guarantee you there are doubts and worries and insecurities that are running through their mind thinking, man, I don't know if this is worth it. I don't know if it's worth my job. I don't know if it's worth my family. I don't know if it's worth my future, my physical body. And then God bless Simon Peter. In verse 68 of chapter 6, Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed And we know that you are the Holy One of God. And so if you let your doubts lead you with the end of a question mark and you never get them answered, you will leave. Answer your questions. Discover the truth. Seek out what is right and what is wrong. And it will be one of the greatest journeys that you've ever went on. And when they encountered the risen Lord, even though you had somebody like Thomas who doubted, even though you had somebody like Peter who denied, even though you had somebody like James and John who ran, who were willing to leave the Lord, Jesus comes unto them and he says, here I am, peace be with you. And their lives were changed forever. The doubters became the announcers. And so what is at stake? What's the point? I'd like to share a story with you. Uh, about a recent man who I looked up to and respected, even though I never got to meet him in person. Uh, His name is Nabil Qureshi. And Nabil, his parents were from Pakistan, and they immigrated to the United States many years ago, and Nabil was born here. And Nabil was raised as a very uh, dominant and faithful Muslim. When he was five years old, he already knew Arabic. He memorized the majority of the Quran at five years old. I mean, the guy's a genius. As a Muslim, he goes to medical school, and it was in Virginia, and he's studying to become a doctor. And he encounters this Christian who was going on to be a philosopher of religion called David Wood. 
And they began to have an exchange because he saw David reading his Bible. He thought that was the dumbest thing that he ever saw, a Christian actually reading their Bible out in public, right? Who knows? And so he walks over to them, over to David Wood, and he begins to challenge him about the truthfulness of Christianity and about the inerrancy of the Bible. And David and him have this exchange, and it turns into a friendship where they go back and forth and they share with each other. And lo and behold, Nabil starts investigating the truthfulness of Islam and the truthfulness of Christianity. And here he is, a medical student, a very intelligent young man, starts to find intelligent, rational, truthful reasons to become a Christian. And he ends up giving his life to Christ. And if you, if you type in his name, you'll probably see this really cool picture of his baptism. He's coming up out of the water with both of his hands. And David Wood is in the background. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ and became a Christian. And he actually became probably one of the most recognized apologists, 33 years old. He was uh, getting ready to go to Oxford University. He traveled around the world and spoke about Jesus, the truthfulness of Christianity. You can read his books. One of his books that he wrote is called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And he's written a couple others. And so he's over at Oxford. He's living on the mountaintop. He's given himself to the Lord. And his parents are just utterly devastated. They do not agree with their son's decision. They can't believe he forsook Muhammad and Islam for this man named Jesus. And so he basically lost everything that was near and dear to him. He completed his education. He got a degree in apologetics. He's at Oxford University. He gave uh, uh, his wife a proposal and they got married and they were married for a few years and he had this beautiful baby and she's just a couple years old, probably about the same age as Piper. And then at Oxford, something happened to, to Nabil, as you can see the picture up on his screen. He got diagnosed at 33 years old with stomach cancer. And so he got treatment, he immediately left Oxford, came back to the States, and they tried to eradicate the cancer with chemotherapy, and it just spread to his chest. And so he just began to pray. The cancer is unstoppable, they can't stop it. They've tried everything. And this is him giving a YouTube video about a couple weeks ago. And he's asking God for a miracle, and he's asking his Christian brothers and sisters to pray for him, that even though medicine has stopped, where God can pick up maybe and, and bring something through. Well, a few days ago, Nabil passed away, and it's just so sad, and I think about myself. I think about, that's only a few years away from where I'm at. I mean, Piper could be just a few years old, and I could leave this life. Cancer could strike my body, and I would never be here. I would be gone. And so in his prayer in this video, he's praying with, with his, his brothers and sisters and he's having doubts and insecurities about his faith. And he says, I believe God is walking through with those doubts with me and that God is here. And he begins to pray and he asks God for a miracle and he says this, but God, even if you let me die, I trust you and I love you. And I think that's where God wants us to be. Not with 100% certainty, but trusting him, even in the midst of our doubts. And so if you're here this morning and you've doubted whether or not Christianity is true, if you're here this morning and you've doubted whether or not you can trust God and you think you have to get it all figured out, you don't. You can start this morning. You can obey the gospel. You can be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. And even if God does take you far too soon, you can live a testimony and a life of trust and obedience. And so we're going to sing a song of invitation. I'm going to ask that you stand and pray with me. And we're going to invite you, if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior up front this morning. Lord, we thank you and we love you, God. Father, we ask that you forgive us for our doubts, Lord, but we know that you are near. We know